Welcome to Roots and Ruminants, your podcast for creative and innovative use of farm, pasture, and rangeland. We're going back to the basics of raising and grazing livestock, growing your own forage, and practical land use. All right, we're off. And we're off to another episode of Roots and Ruminants. We've got uh, a great set of guests coming with us today. We've got Tim and Trudy Oldie with Oldie Cattle Company, the OCC in Palmer, Kansas. And uh, pretty excited about this one. Jared and I, uh, man, we've we've got some great guests this this season, and uh, this is going to be one of the best. I just know it. So um, like we always do, Tim and Trudy, we, uh, we want to thank you for being on, but uh, we'd like to open it up to you to tell our listeners where you're at and then kind of start us off at the ground level with with your cattle operation and maybe give a bit of a family and farm history if you would yeah i was kind of with the family i say my wife trudy and i got two sons in their little 30s that uh one's in actually went through the hurricane in florida last night and the other one's in wichita with his wife so it's her and me and a bunch of well some help uh, we basically started this thing in 79, 78, uh, and then I guess you joined me in about 85, Trudy, right? 82. 82, okay. 82. So anyway, I've had a passion in my family. My, uh, well, it's kind of crazy. My grandpa was a hog buyer, so he learned how to buy and sell. My great-grandpa made a lot of money breeding mammoth jacks around 1900 so how far off can we get and Ah. he bred mules for the war world war one and stuff and so he was able to buy land and stuff for his sons and then my grandpa was one of the sons so we'll go from there my dad had a little farm uh i went off to college i actually had charlays in my teenage years uh thought cattle was everything when i was 10 years old, I'd go to sleep with a cow book in my hand, and uh, Grandpa helped me some. So I did that, and then through college, I was introduced to a couple people, and uh, we started a company called Beef Genetics Research. And so I was fortunate enough to go to Europe and spend some time there, and we, our intent was that's when the exotics were coming in, uh, Simmental, May, all the other, you name it. and we had a desire for the Simmentals, and when we found out there was Fleckfies in Germany and Austria. So went over there and learned more there probably in two months from the German animal scientists than I learned prior. Uh, here we were into big, tall, couldn't get them big enough. The Germans couldn't get them thick, deep, and wide enough, and very forage-based, you know, you know, they they kept saying they're ruminants, quit feeding them grain. So I had to basically 180 degrees relearn, and we imported some females in to off from Austria to Ireland because they had hoof and mouth disease. So we brought in a group of heifers to some farmers, divided them in Ireland, and then bred them there. And then the next generation, we brought those in to the U.S. It was in Kansas, Mankato, Kansas. And there we sold a few to the Arnold brothers up at McIntosh, South Dakota, that really did a phenomenal job with them for 20-some years, actually almost 30 years, and then they dispersed 2001. So that was the basis of the Fleck Cross cattle, and I really loved them. And then while I was there, I saw the the Frisian cattle, and most people, that's probably the most under, misunderstood because they were black and white, but they were very dual purpose. And I saw some Angus, supposedly German Angus, one day on the Audubon, and the guy said, well, they're actually uh, Angus Frisian. And I go, well, you mean Angus Holstein? He said, oh, no, 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 Frisian. So I said, what's the difference? Well, they showed me the muscle, and so then I started looking at all their performance data, which was sec way above us. I mean, they had EPDs like 40 deep back then, and so I was intrigued by the low birth weight, the moderate size. We actually imported a few Frisians out of Ireland because we had room on the plane coming in and started what that time was called Amerifax, which stood for American Frisian Angus, and then we eventually called them Angus twos 
on our own operation. So that was the Angus twos. So today we got registered Angus. Uh, I kind of got into them in the 80s. Uh, sort of sold club calves in the 80s to help buy some land. And then I decided I wanted to, uh, actually as crazy as it is, I had a Kia Enable that I bought and sold a couple million dollars worth of semen on him because uh, that was a hot thing at the time. They won Denver, Fort Worth, Kansas City. So I used a Kia Enable to finance my Angus. What was his name? Il Dino. Il Dino. And he was hot for about two years. And yeah. Select Sire sold thousands of units. And so we was able to buy $200 farm ground. So I was selling drugs, but in Amphils. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they all thought something was up while I was buying land when everybody's going broke in the 80s. And uh, so it worked out. And then in the, oh, about 86, I said, I got to get some actually what I felt were pure Angus, not hybridized, to use on these Frisians, because I had the best Frisian genetics in the world and semen on them. And so I did that, and then I kind of decided maybe we need a few registered Angus. And so then we designed that and tried to keep them like they were. And that was difficult, because the bulls at the time were bigger. And the 6807 bull actually come out of that herd the year I bought them in 67, or in, wait a minute, 70, 87, what was it? 86, yeah, excuse me, 86. Okay. So he was a six model. And he won Midland Bull Test. They didn't know if they were going to be able to give him away because he was four and a half frame, but anyway, eventually I ended up owning a third of him. And so we used him to kind of maintain these cows, but then those cows ended up, we had two or three of them that ended up getting uh, 18, 19, 20 years old. And so we were able to basically try to duplicate them and it was difficult. So we ended up line breeding back to those cows. And today, a lot of our cattle, no matter what breed or whatever, uh, we go to work and line breed back to those three cows. They're in our flex, they're in our Angus twos, they're into everything. Yeah, and then <clears throat> we also have uh, some red Angus, uh, which we're kind of trying to pull out of the black genetics. We went back and used some old red bulls that I thought were very good, very moderate, good uttered back when utters were great and fleshing ability was great. Low birth, low, low birth, and we really love low birth in our cattle. We, we like be honest with you, we like 55, 60 pounders and heifers and 65, 70 in cows. And I think for more reasons than one, nobody wants calving problems and the cows breed back quicker when they have a little calf. Cows with big calves have a little trauma and they're always at the end of calving. So we really design low birth, but still grow. I mean, we find the outliers that can weigh 50, 60 pounds, maybe three generations deep and then find them at might ratio 115, 120, despite people saying the uh, low birth won't grow. Well, they can grow. I know deer aren't very big when they're born either. Uh, so we believe that, and then the fleshing ability is ultimate. Uh, and then one other, I guess one other deal we're doing here in the last 10 years is uh, the centipoles. Uh, we've used the centipole breed a little bit to uh, heat tolerance, and so we're getting into the southern market a little bit, Texas, trying to use something rather than Brahman for the heat tolerance. And Brooksville, Florida ran tests on them back in the 80s and said that uh, they're as tolerant as a Brahman, and then you don't end up, and they're very uh, good meat, uh, moderate sure. and then Teddy Gentry that sings Alabama music is a great friend of mine about like a brother I traveled with him to Cuba even for a week one time that's when you get to know each other <laughs> and so he designed the South Pole cattle that are very good for the South they're just moderate some people think they're too small but I think that means they're about right uh, they're 1,000 11 miles. so we have those and some with just Centipole and Angus both red and black for that heat tolerance 
Man, they go east to fescue country, the extreme fescue tolerance with those cattle. So that was one thing we got, to, I think, as a breed or as an industry, is find this fescue tolerance because so many countries or states and areas have to have fescue. And so you got to figure out what works on it and how to manage fescue, which I'm not, we don't have hardly any fescue here. We use smooth grown grass. So that's so kind of, go ahead. So do we. That's what, that's the bane of our existence too, uh, in grazing is smooth grown grass in South Dakota. And, you know, we can actually get a little seed crop. We kind of do things uh, yeah. totally different. Uh, we don't do cropping. Uh, our cash crops probably this last year was pigweed and crabgrass and chopping it for haylage and we develop our bulls on that so and then triticale in the mix we I don't think we've tilled a piece of ground in 25 years we got they called me the gravel road farmer now I'm the pigweed farmer but it works we like it and uh rotate some uh it's the way it goes well tim i, I think our, our paths maybe briefly crossed uh years ago in 2007 i i was at transova genetics for about five years i was in the western u.s for a while and there was a uh, sales and marketing yeah. director there so we spent a time at chilla coffee and and down in kansas quite a bit um interesting i didn't i did not know that you got into the centipole breed this so if i by characterizing that Centipole have just a, a touch, just like a 10%-ish of Boss Syndicus breeding, and the rest of it is is uh, kind of European descendant? Is that correct? They or? should be all Boss Taurus. They should be all Boss Taurus. Okay. Yeah, yeah the Afghander that they go back to is Boss Taurus. It's okay. a South African breed. Now, they were brought into the Virgin Islands and then crossed with the Red Pole. Okay. The problem was there was a breeder down there that was into big, very big, and he snuck a little Brahmin in. Okay. And so when the cattle came in eight, ten years after, there was kind of two herds, big and little. Teddy took the little ones. And when they DNA'd them, when that become available, uh, some of them showed Brahmin in them. Okay. And they've kind of disappeared. They've kind of bred that out of it. Okay. Kind of so a, that, that, that heritage of cattle has disappeared. Yeah, right. And Teddy's kept the other. And I actually got a couple, three cows from Teddy, and I, I used a bull that truthfully looked like as good a red Angus bull as you'd ever look at, thick, deep, okay. but he was actually Cinepol, and he DNA'd Cinepol. So we okay. used him a little bit and sons and grandsons, and so that was the one bull we've used. And line bred to him and then there was a couple cows that no matter what we bred them to our black bulls eureka anchor jet stream and no matter what those cows raise good ones so that that's how we kind of build up our centipole is finding a couple freak outliers mm-hmm. and others how do you spell that how do you huh? spell s-e-n-n-e-p-o-l got it uh do you get into the export market much with those two, Tim? We haven't. Uh, we've got a young man now that's doing some exporting, and he's been up here, and he was intrigued by him. He sells a lot of Brahmin semen into Colombia, Uruguay, and stuff. And I don't know. We, we used to export bulls and cattle to Argentina a lot. In fact, I'd say probably 80% of the American or Angus genetics in Argentina carry OCC blood. Yeah. In fact, the bull they're promoting now is an Argentine bull. If you go back in his pedigree, he's got our stuff in there a couple times. Okay. And so they're very. But in Argentina, your your economics, your cattle price is half. So you and the grain price is the same. So you can't put a lot of groceries into your cattle there. And we got a, a guy from Paraguay that uses our genetics. Uh, and he just told me, he said, we sold our two-year-old bulls for meat, and they had 900-pound carcasses, and he netted $880 for them. Yeah. But their land is equivalent to about 500 an acre versus right. three, 4,000. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we, we find a way to dump all of our profitabil- profitability into uh, increased land prices almost immediately after we get it. So, you know, we just we just even the scale that way, right? Yeah, I guess. 
I know. I guess land's going down up there, right? Uh, I would say not. You know, I, I lived up by Falkton one time, or Redfield, and I remember sure. a guy buying a couple three quarters for 250 an acre, and everybody said he's going to go broke. Yeah. And God only knows what that'd bring now. Yeah. Well, I, I remember my, my, you know, it was a long time ago, my, my great-grandfather told me the story. He just passed away six, seven years ago, but tell the story when he uh, got done with middle school, country school, you know, he had a chance when he was 16 years old to buy uh, buy a half section of ground for seven dollars an acre, but the other, but the other half section in that section that he could have bought the whole thing on, they wanted seven and a half dollars an acre, and so that was way too much. They were way, no, like, yeah, no yeah. way he could make that work. So, yeah. yeah. Well, we all look back at what we should have bought. Well, he yeah. lived long enough to see the half section that he could have bought for seven and a half dollars an acre sell for seven thousand dollars an acre. So, yeah. you know, a thousand fold increase in his lifetime which is well, my good my good and my good wife told me a couple of times you buy another farm don't come home so i quit <laughs> and now i've seen one the other day that i passed at 400 bring four thousand so go but, go uh, see it what brought you to you know you said redfield falcon so i'm assuming maybe rockham zell was maybe right where you well were. what it was we had the milliuses there and yeah. Jim Millius was a terrific farmer, and Don was his brother. He's passed away. They've all passed. And they were using the Frisian cattle. Yeah. They had Angus up there, you know. Uh, oh, what was the brothers there at Highmore? Uh, yeah. Huh? Clay Clayton and Ted. Jennings. Yeah, Clayton and Ted Jennings. In fact, you know, Clayton wrote a book, uh, Handshake, Code of the West. You ever read that? It's right there. You can okay. See the yeah, there's handshake. My there's name's in there. Return of the handshake. Well, let's get it out. Okay. Yeah, my name's in there somewhere that we brought in the Frisians. Uh, Clayton brought in Frisians. And anyway, yeah, my name's in there. I've had a couple of guys tell me that. So you look. Well, Clayton, Clayton was a master merchandiser. Yeah. And Ted, Ted was a big flyer. You know, he owned a sale barn. He had about 10,000 cows, but then he invested in a, uh, what do you call it, a uh, casino. And that kind of went wrong at the wrong time there in the 80s. Why did the Frisians go away? Well, how do you promote something that's black and white and horned? You know, they were the best cattle in Europe. Well, here's the reality. There was more Frisians, and there still is. Now they bred them all Holstein or Red Holstein. The Fleckies are even gotten ruined because of milk versus meat. But there was more Frisians in Germany than there was all the other breeds put together. And probably the best thing I was ever taught by some good animal breeding people over there was if a breed's good, it will spread. And he says, you go to the French breeds and you'll find them in one county in America and one county in France. And that tells you what, maybe how good they are. And I never forgot it, and that's pretty true. Yeah. And yet they all have a little place, you know, whether it's Bronvay, Pinsgauer, you know, we, we actually, Beef Genetics, we imported the first Solaire cattle. And we couldn't give them away. And then about eight years later, some Hereford breeders brought them in, and they got pretty crazy hot. And those ain't all bad cattle at a low percentage. They'll run the mountains and, you know, the brisket disease thing. It, they're okay. Right, yeah. Got some pieces. What, so you mentioned your Angus 2 herd being mm -hmm. different than your standard Angus. Can you talk through the breeding of that composite and then how you market well, it differently? The Angus too, you know, originally when we had the Frisians, we, we made, with Clayton was in there, uh, we called it Marifax, which stood for American Frisian Angus Cross. Sure. Uh, Three-eighths, five-eighths. The problem was we had some breeders in the group that wanted them bigger, not better. And so they were using some massive, big, tall Angus bulls. And I couldn't live with that. And I'll be honest with you, trying to breed a perfect three-eighths bull seemed not there. And I had quarter bloods, five-sixteenths, three-sixteenths. I finally said, you know, I don't care whether they're an eighth or a sixteenth Frisian. If I got the other part, Angus, that's really good, I don't need more than that. And that's kind of where we are today. We sell probably 160, 80 of those Angus two bulls. 
to people that used to say we won't use nothing but an Angus bull. Mm. And once they use these, they got the Frisians were machine melt uh, completely uh, in Europe ten years before America was. So they selected for small teats. And America was still hand mounting. So what'd you have? Big teats. And so some of the first Holsteins that might have got snuck in some Angus cattle put some big udders in them. So, but you could take these little thousand pound Angus cows, put a quarter Frisian in them, and them cattle would walk and talk. And they're, they're really, we ran them through the Meat Animal Research Center there in the germplasm evaluation. It was actually a marbling study with uh, uh, F, what's the Japanese cattle? Wagyu. Wagyu, uh, Norwegian Reds, Angus, and a couple others. And the Frisians, the, the data is there if a guy wants to see it. Those Frisian cattle were phenomenal. You know, they, but people don't know at Meat Animal Research Center when those cows got to be six years old, they butchered them. And I'm going, what? Why? He said, we weigh all the organs. Nobody knew that. I don't think anybody knows that. I found out accidentally. Yeah, we weigh the organs, so we measure the ruminant as compared to total weight, the heart, the liver, you know, kind of like trying to find a racehorse with a heart that's twice as big. Uh, I guess, but the marbling was equivalent to a 0.3 marbling. Actually, the marbling was pretty good in Frisian, and another thing I learned over there was that uh, the correlation to butter fat and marbling. You know, like Jerseys have high butter fat. Yeah. They marble well. Yeah. And so the Frisians, actually, I've got semen on some bulls from the 70s that uh, they're close to three dams we're over four and a half to five percent butter fat. And today, you know, the Holsteins are two, two and a half. So they were good, good cattle, but yeah. Americans passed them because they thought everything black and white was a dairy animal. And, what, and I did too. The, what's the butter fat of just a, an Angus cow, a red Angus cow? Three. Three, okay. So it is higher than Holstein. Yeah, a little bit. And then you got the A1, A2 thing. Yeah. Well, and our cattle are A2. I mean, our Angus are. Now, that was accidental, not planned. Mm -hmm. And I got that found out from a dairy guy at Utah University or Utah State, one or the other. He tested them, and he said, you realize you got A2? I said, I don't know. What is that? Is that a defect? Yeah. He said, no, that's a good thing. <laughs> so, so that's a little extra benefit. And now, supposedly, they found another genome with a higher butter fat in the Holsteins. But we'll see. Yeah, we actually just talked about A1A2 a few weeks ago on a podcast with a dairyman, grass-fed dairyman out of Northern California and beta casing gene and that kind of stuff. Uh, we call our podcast Roots and Ruminants, but if we were to go back and do it, it could be Roots and Ruminants and Livestock Genetics <laughs> because yeah. we, we tend to tend down those paths quite a bit. All right, so, yeah, you're on page uh, – you're listed on page 218, and then right next to a picture here of Big Notch. Remember oh this gosh. bull? Yeah, that was Clayton's bull. I thought he yeah. was too big. Yeah, <laughs> he's pretty big. But I brought in some ones about three inches shorter frame. But Clayton did well. Yeah, and that was a Frisian bull. That was a full blood Frisian, and he imported them from Ireland. All right. And he probably sired ten thousand progeny in this country. What What is the status of Marifax? I I just saw. I, don't, I think it was. I think it was last week. We we're up looking at a chunk of grass with my family north of here 20 30 miles and i went by a place uh, where somebody had a sign and, and you know that they you know so and so can't remember the name and then you know angus and amerifax and i thought man i hadn't seen what that. town oh i'll bike uh Heckler? raymond crocker up in there uh, okay. wasn't that far the, north well some of them, there was a group of breeders around hecla okay. uh, and then around uh aberdeen, aberdeen a couple and then uh falcon Okay. And Redfield area, there was several. But uh, and then and they, Quirk, Quirk Land and Cattle uh, were involved. In. in fact, they ran the association. And then John died three, four years ago. And I'm not sure if it's still active. actually going. Yeah, no, I, I just hadn't heard the word Ameripax in maybe a decade. You know, I just hadn't really heard it at all. I didn't know if anybody kept it up or not. So we actually, what was amazing, uh, the, the word Angus too, 
was originally done by the Angus Association. And they were going to, the executive secretary set it up to upgrade Angus. And because, you know, Simmental, everybody was competing, and rather than sneaking them in the Angus breed, let's make it legal. And by golly, they got voted out at the meeting, I mean big time, when a person was a vote, not a delegate. And they said no. So the executive secretary, who's now dead, he, uh, he took it down in the basement of the Angus Association. And then I asked him, I said, what are you going to do with that? And he said, nothing. I said, can I have it and use it and copyright it? He said, I'd be honored. So it was actually a brain thing of them that started it. I remember a conversation I had with uh, well, was Gerald Callahan and a couple other guys um, <laughs> were up at, up at Bill Davis's at Rolling Rock when I was in Montana with Transova. But I remember sitting around them with the, trying to finish our, our second 175 of Pendleton whiskey that Bill Davis had put in front of us. If you know <laughs> Surely Davis not. Bill but didn't yeah, drink. No, no, no. This is like at noon. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I asked him, I said, this is maybe 2008, 2007. And I said, you know, this, this composite thing is, is here to stay. It's coming, I think. And I said, Angus has the opportunity to basically take, take it over, it, take it over. Right. And if you're making a Sim Angus or, or anything, Right? Yes. Any composite, you could run that all in there, and you would have the absolute powerhouse. You'd have uh, not only they have a they have a kind of a monopoly on data now, but you, you'd have everything. You'd yep. be able to control everything you did. To Absolutely, you could yes. have terminal yeah. Angus, yeah. maternal Angus. Yes. Yeah. And I remember Bill slamming his the table, and I said that the function of the American Angus Association is to is to preserve the integrity of the Angus breed, and that's it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And that was the prevailing thought, I think, that that institution has held since then, is that no? Nope. Well, uh, when, they, when they voted that Angus too out at the national meeting, the then Montana breeder, and it wasn't Bill, got up and said, we have the best pure breed in the world, so why screw it up? But they weren't pure. Uh, right. That's the problem. <laughs> there was a few straight bulls running around, I think. Like okay, so um, a very, very awesome, interesting background. You know, today your your genetics are synonymous with easy keeping, functional females, three dimensional, lower mature cow size. Um, and it, I, I did not actually know the the background in the the you know the beef region days and the Kenya days. It seems like you've created an antidote to yeah. the Eldino uh, <laughs> issue that you created. Yeah. I've been accused of that. Yeah. One of the animal science professors at K-State said, Tim's going to breed these Angus small enough he can go back and sell more Kianina semen. <laughs> <laughs> Which I don't think I'd do. No. But that was a good terminal cross. You could take a 900-pound Angus cow and get a, in fact, we had a Kianina steer half-blood actually out of an Amerifax cow that won the American Royal, and he weighed... 1399, of course, you know, they all don't shrunk them to that. And he graded uh, high choice 16.9 ribeye. Yeah. So he's one of the show steers that not only won on foot, but 59 and a half inches tall. Hmm. The judge was Gary Minish from Virginia, and, you know, he's about 5'5", five, five, and he had to stand in front of the steer because yeah. he couldn't see over it. And that was 1983. Yeah, and we actually sold him in Denver at the Kianina Bull Sale, and they bought him for seven thousand and castrated him, and took him to American Royal and won it. Jens, Jensen family in El Reno, Oklahoma. Still visit with them about every month. Huh. Fantastic. So, it, very interesting. I, I did not know this that they were the the Mineral Research Center. Mark was was harvesting and, and weighing you know organ size you know at, at a fixed age. And that's one thing that I've always always wondered is is that as because the the dollar B phenomenon right that was it's it's strong but it's not as strong as it was back in the you know 2005 to 2015 era in the Angus breed was was so focused on carcass weight right as a as a metric and and carcass weight being driven by dressing percentage and I, I always wonder if the if the the desire to increase dressing percentage has caused us to artificially shrink visceral organ mass, which is necessary for functional animals, 
absolutely uh, to, to try and just get them to yield more and and it's like why are we trying to shrink organs you know why are we trying to shrink heart size liver size lung size all those really really necessary things um, um if you see that as a as a contradictory issue as well absolutely you know we're taking a ruminant and turn them into a monogastric yeah why I mean, I can take some of our best stuff and finish them on five pounds of grain, like they do in Argentina, three and versus 30 pounds of grain. Now, it's fine when corn's three bucks, but if corn be seven and fat cattle a dollar and a quarter, it don't work. It doesn't begin to work. Hmm. But I like... Probably... Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I'm just... Well, I was going to say cow size. That's yeah. Yeah. We we have a lot of 12, you know, a lot of people say our cattle are too small. But we have a lot of 12, 1,300-pound cows that, and a lot of them 14, but we don't feed them to get big. I mean, they're on forage. They calve out at about 950, and they gain about 50 pounds a year, and that's where they mature. And uh, so, but we got capacity, you know, and I learned both from the Germans and the Argentine people. There was a guy in Argentina who died I don't know, in 2000, he got cancer, but he was kind of the bondsman of South, of South America. And he always said, when you get in front or back of an animal, a uh, ruminant, you better see a foot of belly stick out on both sides. And if you don't, you ain't got enough guts. And I never forgot that. I, I like them so wide they won't go down an alleyway. In fact, we got a cow, one of our best Angus, will not go into a silencer chute. Because she's too wide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I got to get a bigger silencer. That's exactly where I was going with my thoughts of how you've developed your herd and your genetics to fit your environment. Right? They have to be deep body, big room, and big middle cattle to thrive in your environment. So if it is a low input system, they better thrive on forage and they better go and Absolutely. Better find it themselves because you, you, you just can't. In your, in the, it does fit your environment in Kansas there too, right? Like it's, oh, absolutely. We kind of have two environments. We got a, a spring calving cows here, and then 90 miles west, we got West 81 at Beloit, Kansas. We have several thousand acres in a block where we have all fall calving. And those fall cows literally get fed about twice a week, a little hay, and maybe a couple, three, four pounds of distillers till March 1, and then they're on their own. And then we wean the calves around the 1st of August. Because if we don't wean the calves, or I mean, if we wean the calves, the cows would get too fat, literally get too fat. You know, everybody else is weaning their calves so the cows can catch up flesh to be yeah. ready to calve again. And ours, it's the other way. But you do that, and then you'll find the outlier calf at 10 and a half months weighed 950 pounds on grass or some flat crosses my way, 1,050. And you're going, wow. So you take those outliers, both Angus and Cross, them top six, eight, ten bulls, take the top 30, 40 heifers, mate them, and keep doing that for 20 years. Pretty soon you've got uh, some pretty amazing stuff on forage. So that's how we went there, stockpiled native grass, which is a little more shorter grass like buffalo and side oats, which side oats is you know, the candy grass. But here we actually rent stock fields, corn and bean fields from neighbors that have no cattle and now learn that cow manure won't kill them and compact the ground. And so we rent stock fields and run these cows for four months in the stock fields. 50 cents, 75 cents a day and running water. I mean, how can you beat it? Yeah. You can't. And everybody else is running them stock fields. They're feeding them every day. They got lick tubs. I don't know how people can afford lick tubs. Man. Whoa. They are expensive. So you're, that's your spring cabin herd, though? Do you do that with your fall cabin herd at all? The fall the cabin, we leave, we leave there, and they, native, they just stockpile on native grass. Sure. And a little distillers or a little pro. Tell about March 1. And then, you know what? The cows are bred or they're not, and you just let them go. And if they lose 50 pounds, even 100, which they don't, come June, they gain 100 back. In fact, we preg them and weigh them in May, and amazingly, with the calves still on them, they might gain 150, 200 pounds by August 1, nursing that big calf. 
So then they're back in shape. You get them off August 1. You give them 30 days to start calving. Beautiful. They go into the fall in nice shape. Give them a little bit of groceries and, you know, pretty good hay, a little alfalfa right in December when you're AIing them for 30 days. And then shut her down. It can be done. Oh, yeah. We got a neighbor you, that feeds them every day with a silage. You had okay. mentioned your 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 triticale program, your pigweed, crabgrass, silage. Oh, it's nuts. Uh, I do everything except silage the roadside ditches. I might get there, but <laughs> no, I like. <laughs> You know, we kind of found the crabgrass thing 20 years ago on a farm I bought, and we ended up leaving it through the summer and eating it down. But then I learned I had to leave it go to seed once in August to get the seed for next year, and then we'd enter seed triticale. Well, the nice thing is frost kills crabgrass at 32 degrees. How do you kill crab pigweeds? I don't know how to kill pigweeds other than 32 either, but so... We kind of do that pigweed crabgrass. So what we do now, we plant triticale, rye, and maybe the, the wheat, that uh, late maturing wheat, like Willow Creek or something like that, yeah. and blend it. So you kind of got the rye first, triticale for gray, and then we chop it or graze it till about April 1st, and then we get them, and then we'll chop a crop. And then instead of killing it, uh, we just let it grow back to weeds, crabgrass, pigweeds, sunflowers. The only thing I don't like in there is mare's tail. That kind of puts a twangy taste to it. But they eat it. Chop it real fine, run a kernel processor so you shred it up. And then we mix that with some straw and CRP hay. And actually the protein on that crabgrass and, and pigweed stuff is 10, 10 11% protein. And 59, 60 energy. It's really quite good. So it works, and we don't have to put no seed. Don't have to. And then we got volunteer sedan that we've had now, and you let it go to seed in summer, and then let the cows tromp it in in the winter, and the next spring you got volunteer sedan coming again. I think eventually you wouldn't have to spend no money on nothing but cattle, just bulls, just buy bulls. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> just have enough seed in the bank. Keep just on coming back seed from now. Yeah. You know, you can you can make cows work, but you got to make them work. And too many people f like feeding them. You don't ever feed a cow in the winter every day. You feed them about every third day if you're out grazing, because otherwise they'll be there waiting. I mean, you feed them two, three days in a row, they're going to be there every day waiting. They ain't going to be grazing. And out at the West Ranch there where we do the fall, we actually save half the grass, you know, for winter grazing. And we, we harvest no silage hardly and feed a little hay but uh yeah it it works and the calves okay i always say yeah we ain't 800 pound calves but they're 10 months old you know they're not five months but so we play catch up but we develop the bulls slow sell them at 18 months 24 okay. months 12 1300 and then bulls develop that way genetically they're going to gain weight i'd say 80 percent of our bulls when we sell them, we'll gain weight out there breeding cows instead of going to pieces. Are you putting those? Are you putting the bulls back on grass then, and then you're selling them that following winter, right? Fall, well, winter, or what? That's what we'd like to do. But when you got three, four hundred bulls, uh, it's just easier to dry lot them and feed them hay leach and hay because. You know, you have them bulls out in pastures. I don't care if you got an eight wire fence. They're going to be fighting, tearing up things, yeah. uh, breeding everything but the reindeer. I mean, they just are yeah. a pain in the butt in a pasture. Trudy, is is your role within the operation more on the the, the sales side of things with, with marketing of the bulls and that, or? I do about anything and everything. You do it all. That's awesome. Whatever I'm asked to do. This, this thing, and oh, and Trudy has as good a quarter horses as out there. Oh, okay. Her, even her, talk to horses. her horses, trust me, they're her horses, not mine. But that's my therapy. Yeah. That's how I get away from everything else. Yeah, she's going to a fraternity tomorrow and fight the politics. Yeah. Uh, I just like to raise good ranch horses. But we don't have very many, or she does, I gotta say, hers. Those are hers. You know, the cattle are ours and the machinery's mine. That's what we agree on. 
Sure, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's worked for 40 years, so. But Trudy's very good at marketing. I mean, she sells the semen, most of the semen, and she knows the bulls okay. as good as I do. Uh, and she could sell the cattle, but she's always hesitant to price them. That's how I stay married. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't put prices on things except my horses. <laughs> and then she won't price them. No. Horses so, stay here. The good fillies stay here. In, uh, so, so in your Angus herd, if, um, I'm assuming you'll, you'll, you'll use outside bulls from time to time? or Never. Most, never. I haven't in 25 years. Okay, and I'll tell you why. I can't find one that won't destroy our udders, our feet, the low birth weight. I mean, we tried it for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. And it just, then we'd have a bad udder. we go, well, here's where it comes from. You know, and here's the thought. I finally got to the point, and I was told this by, I learned everything from people a lot smarter than me. I just didn't know enough of them old good people breeders. But they said, uh, make sure you see the mother the grandmother and the great grandmother. And I learned when I'd go see a bull, I want to see the mother. And then I said, let me see the grandmother. Well, I don't know where she's at. She's up in the mountains. Well, I learned if I couldn't see grandma too, I wouldn't breed to her. And that was, that's there. And you know, the most of the breeds today are correcting heirs. You know, they're either correcting birth weight or correcting feet. And I think a lot of breeds today have got a terrific problem on longevity. I mean, we like to run cows 12, 14 years old pretty easily. Uh, and they can. Or I like to sell cows 8, 9 years old for regular 4-year-old price because people know they still got some years. Or they'll buy them as a donor cow. You know, if they lasted 13 years, they're pretty good. So I can't, I wouldn't say I'd never use outside. The ones I would use would be Argentine, but they're all our breeding. They're all lined up with our breeding. In fact, even the show ring down there, they put them thick and deep and massive. And if you go to the Palermo show, I'll bet you 90% of them have our bulls in them two or three times. So both show ring and in the pasture, but they use, they don't use freak necks and straight legs and that stuff would you say that you have a a any kind of a structured line line breeding program within your your herd or even parts of it or are you trying to diversify as much as you can within your bull battery you know i don't think it's structured uh i just i tell you when i mate i kind of look at and i'm very blessed although i'm getting old night but i can almost see every female in that pedigree because we raised them and I can see what her udder looked like her feet or what her tail head and so I probably breed half you might say phenotypically because I think it's important you know legs and things and and you know phenotype sells whether you sell a set of bred heifers yeah. at a sale barn if they all look like peas in a pod they're going to sell if they're all over the place they're not going to bring as much so I want uniformity and I love when people come to our bull sale and they say, man, they all look alike. And to me, that's the best compliment I get is they all look, there ain't just that one or two that just totally sticks out. And the same as females, you know, they, I've had guys say, well, just send me six or eight females and, or they want to buy a donor, you know, and they think, well, I got to spend 30,000. I said, no, let's, let's take five of them for 30,000, 6,000 a piece. And hopefully they, and it turns out, most of them do turn out. You know, you buy that much money in one, something's going to go wrong. Mm -hmm. They will every time. Mm -hmm. But to propagate it down the road, we'll have to see. You know, the future is we have a tremendous amount of bull customers. We got people actually that bought bulls for 40 years every time in California. We got a lot of them 20 years, and they won't go nowhere else. And they're like, where are we going to go? And I said, yeah, there'll be somebody out there. We're kind of trying to help some young people, both red and black, to to keep it, but then keep it straight. Some of them, they buy our cows, and then they go, oh, I'm going to get the EPDs better. So then they go use the freak number bull. Well, then the numbers look good. And if you got to have numbers to sell your cattle, so be it. But then all of a sudden they find out, ooh, I'm half good. I'm half bad. And so we're, we are very... Uh, 
particular about using something out across. I pick them by the mothers. You know, if I got a bull that ratio 102 and has the right mother, grandmother, and great grandmother, I'll use him versus a 115 ratio and bull out of a, you know, mother or grandmother that wasn't ideal. Sure. But we are don't have still, to throw many females out. Are, are yeah. you keeping up with, with EPDs? I mean, you're obviously doing some weights or finding ratios and that, but. Well, you know, I pay attention to yeah. birth weight, dollar yen, direct calving. I mean, calvinese and uh, maybe scrotal. I mean, I, I'll be honest with you, I'm not a scrotal fanatic. And I'll challenge this, and, I, and people hear this, they want to challenge me, but what I've noticed, a lot of bulls, the bigger the scrotal, the bigger the udders and their daughters. Hmm. And I see in the Angus breed, the biggest scrotal ones have big, and then you take the the outliers with the small teats, the 5522 ZXT, 6807s that had the beautiful tight udders, they're all negative scrotal. Mm -hmm. So you you check it. Challenge yeah. me on it. No, I've never thought about that, but that actually makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's the same. It's the same. And, I, and again, I was told that by another smart guy in Argentina, and, and I gave that in a speech one time, and the guy from Toronto, or on well, whatever it was, university, challenged me. And I said, well, then prove me wrong. And a month later, he said, I can't prove you wrong. I can't prove you're right, but you sure ain't wrong. Because he says, I looked up about 20 bulls, and a lot of them plus 1.8 uh, scrotal bulls had bad other daughters. Okay. So I think it's correlated. Yeah. You, you know, a good medium is enough. And, I, and another one I'll say is this docility. You know, our cattle show negative docility, and everybody's, well, we can't use them because they're crazy. Well, you go through our herd, there's not a gentler set of cattle or bulls. But our mothers are mothers, and when they calf, they kind of like say, I got this taken care of, see you tomorrow. You want to weigh that calf, let's wait 12 hours. And I respect that. I like moms that do that. Now, I don't want her killing her calf or chasing me up a tree. But I think docility is highly correlated to calf vigor. You take these extremely high docility, them calves are stupid. They don't get up and suck. I do, I do agree with that. I think that there is, there, there definitely is a downside to the super high docility. Uh, oh, I, I, and I see you guys at Cavan Wall through a Cavan barn so they can judge udders and docility when they calve. I mean, wouldn't you love to calve 500 of them in Cavan barn? Not me. No. 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 Well, we work at it, and, you know, we ain't got them perfect, but they sure work for us, and I tell you, the... You know, we sell 300-plus bulls a year private treaty, and you don't see us advertising. Mm -hmm. uh, it's word of mouth. It's amazing in Utah and Montana, North Dakota. Uh, you'll have a guy get a bull or two from us, and then they all brand, work together in a group, six, eight people, and they say, where'd you get them midget bulls? Oh, I ain't going to tell you. And, you know, the next year they see these thick-butted calves, and they go, oh, they ain't too bad. And then the next year or two they see these daughters, two-year-olds with pretty little udders, nice calves, and they go, are you going to tell us where you get your bulls? Well, yeah, maybe. And you go, now we might be selling bulls to six people in that area. It's amazing. I mean, it feeds on itself. If you got it, you know, in your business, if you got a good product, people talk about it, and they tell others, and that's the reality of it. It works. Most of the time, the ones that advertise the most probably ain't got as good a product. Can be true. Fair enough. Fair enough. I want to go back to like your your setup within within your area and talk through your your grazing management. So you have a lot of smooth brome. And Kansas is known for smooth brome production, but you also have a lot of good hard native grasses. So your quality of grazing at like through the year, what that looks like, and then kind of how you manage that flush of smooth brome initially, and and then you know your carry over native grasses and how you're grazing those. Yeah, you know, I bought several or quite a few quarters of lands in the 80. And typical homestead here, 160, would be left 50 acres of grass. And then they broke the rest. You know, whatever was rough in a ditch, they left. 
So I went in there and took that other 100 acres of, of farm. I'm the only guy in here, I think, that's planted 5,000 acres or 4,000 acres of farm ground back to grass in the last 40 years. But I plant half of it the cool season, half the warm stream warm season, either switch Indian or the or mix, kind of like CRP. And then I can kind of run them cattle through cool season, warm season, try to make that quarter of grass split maybe five ways, six ways, and do it that way. And then if we get a lot of rain, which we haven't been getting the last few years, you know, we can we could actually graze probably into December and then go to stock or November, go to stock fields. And then that brome will be greening up in March, and we can bring the cows home from the stalks, kick them out in the brome, and let them calve out in the fields in the brome. So it works. Yeah, it works good. We've tried the, the meadow bromes a little bit with uh, alfalfa. I got a young pair of neighbor kids. I let them have a little land to put alfalfa and meadow brome, and so I get a few little square bales for bait and horse hay. And uh, so, anyway, I like that metal brome alfalfa mix, but we have a hard time keeping it here. The chinch bugs and grasshoppers seem to like it too good. So that there, that your area is, what did we say? We were talking about your rainfall. Is it like 12 to 14 inches? Well, here where we live is actually about 23, 4. Oh, okay. And the West Ranch is about 20, but we've had less than 20 inches of rain in the last three years at the West Ranch. I mean, it's terrible. Nothing. It's, I mean, we're already eating grass we should be eating in March. So we're going to have to buy some grass hay and, you know, we're, well, we're actually selling a fair amount of cows. We just we haven't sold enough females lately, and I thought the market would go up. But, you know, we still haven't got people excited about expanding numbers. You know, the bankers, amazing to me, you know, they say if they got four legs and two ears, they're all worth the same price. And it, yeah. I've had seen it's tougher to sell good commercial cows, I mean, really good cows, for as much premium as we did in the 90s and 2000. You know, we'd sold Marifax cows for three, 4,000 back then, and now it's like, uh, 2,500. They want to give you what they'll bring at the sale barn. Yeah. yeah. And I can't believe how many cows in the sale barn are getting butchered pregnant cows nobody wants to nobody wants to they'll all get told it's going to crash like in 15 yeah. i don't think it will uh, well, we're not expanding i don't that's the the major major difference everybody's like oh it's going to crash it's like it it's not going to crash until we expand too hard and we're definitely not expanding and i, I no. th this is the third year in a row now that you know these opens are bringing about the same amount as the breads Yep. And everybody was was assured that we were going to see every good bread heifer start with a three, you know, starting the fall, going all the way through January, February, and that is not materializing at all. No, nope. no, and I don't know. You know, we got the age of the farmer rancher. The young people would rather drive a tractor with GPS and mm -hmm. listen to stereo. Uh, I'm not sure they want to fight cows. Uh, and then you got areas like Utah and places, the feds are taking them off the, off the mountain ranges. They used an excuse of a drought, took them off. Well, now they ain't letting them come back. I mean, you're talking 100,000 cows. So I, I don't know. And then here, they're still breaking up the grass. I mean, these guys with $3 corn are still breaking grass. Here too. Here and I don't know if that, that mentality will change. It will eventually if... I don't know. I'm not sure it will this time. I don't think. I think cattle would have to get so ridiculously high, and corn would have to get cheaper and cheaper. Maybe they'd try it. And you know, we're seeing a few of these grain farmers, strictly grain farmers, that hated cows, starting to think that maybe they ought to get. A few. And I, I tell them like we have about four quarters of uh, crabgrass pigweed. We just graze. And I say, why haul your cows 70 miles to rent grass? For 50 an acre, why don't you plant some cover crop? Well, I got to plant corn and beans, keep my base up. I, I don't understand it. <laughs> That's the one sector that I think we've seen um, grow cattle numbers as you talk about cover crops and soil health and tying all that together. And people are understanding that livestock integration on farmland is a good thing for soil Absolutely. health and boosting yields. So we have, you know, I mean, it's I'm not saying this is a huge movement, but there has been a slight nudge for folks to try to bring cows back to farms that haven't had them for a generation no and, and, and I, it seems like 
it is you know it has to be the younger you know that next generation coming in that really wants them and wants to be a cowboy and have some and it's got to be more. profitable for the hours you put in and you know you can't you can't run cows on a 40 hour week i mean it's pretty hard and whereas you can grain farm on a 20 hour week except at harvest and plant it's a different mentality it is a different but, mentality. but another research thing you could ever do is to get somebody to take say a cornfield or bean field and strip it and run cows on part of it and not and then next year compare the yields and i've seen a couple of guys we rent they actually think they pick up two to five bushel an acre where the cows have been with the manure in there mm -hmm. and i know it is but you gotta have to have the data maybe to convince some people yeah. manure's good yeah cycling of nutrients faster and you should have more readily available nitrogen or phosphorus because you're in cows yeah. so that bump's going to come quicker than just leaving the stuff I, let it my neighbor's a very good no, no my neighbor really good no till and he wants to get he's been at it from the day one and he wants to get to where he's not using any chemicals and you know fertilizer and i said well go to argentina and i said they crop it for three years they run cows on it for three years and or hey you know what i mean they they do a rotation that works and i don't think there's enough rotation here it's corn and beans corn and beans nobody will plant oats nobody will plant alfalfa i, I just think we need to rotate that's a weed problem is because we're not rotating yeah, it, it's 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 rotation, and there's the other commonly used, you know, South America, Uruguay, Argentina rotation, which is you know three to five years of a of a perennial grass for grazing yep. in the rotation to break that annual weed cycle. Um, yep. That is is definitely not not a commonplace thing in most of the center part of the U.S. anyway. Um, but it's it's tremendously underutilized, and I, Absolutely. I think our chemistry is getting less and less effective all the time. And there's there's two other reasons they're going to confound that. One, the pipeline for for new chemistry is not is not great, despite what I think everybody tells you. We don't have a lot of silver bullets coming. They're going to get harder to get approved. They're going to get more restrictive, and they're going to be expensive if they do. And uh, I, I just it's also not real conducive to what the, the consumer preference is. I think we've got to be a I, I just think being raising corn soybeans in a rotation is going to be more problematic in the next 20 years than it has been the last 20 by a lot. Oh, I, I agree. I'm not a farmer, but I, I see the problem uh, big time. Yeah. And the cost of machinery, oh, you know, versus running some cows. You can run cattle pretty reasonable uh, with machinery, but boy, you Yeah, your can't. overhead with the oh. cattle is much different. Oh, yeah, I mean you can buy a used swather and a baler and have a hundred thousand tied up, and you can't hundred thousand doesn't buy tires for some of these tractors. <laughs> yeah, that's good. But no, you need to go over to animal meat and animal research and look up that data. There, there's a lot of interesting data there that way back they wouldn't publish because they thought that somebody would use it to promote their bull. But now there's a new group of people there, and they're glad to dispel it, give it to somebody. But if there's, they did a lot of things for a reason, and we thought it was nuts at the time, but it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. It really is pretty good. Yeah, very good. Well, this has been great. Thank you so much yeah. for joining us. I really appreciated the conversation. Very interesting stuff. Yeah, fantastic. Well, let's do it again. Deal. Yeah. And Maybe then come visit. Come, you know, see the product. Come see the product. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we got to do is come see the product. And then I'll come up and see your office. <laughs> now we'll go out and look at some stuff out in the field. We're not yeah. going to spend time at the office. <laughs> we'll go look at some plantings and some new stuff. So. Yeah. All right. Well, we hope you enjoyed another episode of the Roots and Ruminants podcast. Uh, let us know what you thought of it. Uh, you can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, all those social media things. And, uh, you know, if you ever have any questions, just give us a call. Um, we've got a toll-free number here at 888-498-7333. Be glad to hear from you. Thank you.